Welcome to Where's the Proof? Organizing and Writing Genealogical Findings. This is part two of three, Organizing Your Research. I'm Lisa Stokes, an accredited genealogist professional with ICAP Gen, and I accredited in the Mid-South region of the United States in January of 2018. I'm also a study group leader for the ICAP Gen study groups. In this presentation, I will cover some ideas and techniques to help you organize your research findings in order to prepare for writing. Please consider watching the recording of part one to help you establish a foundation of some of the concepts that uh, are in this presentation. The first step in organizing your writing is to review the objectives set at the beginning of the research and to define exactly what it is that you are proving in each proof throughout your report. If there's more than one objective, make a list of the objectives to prove in the report. Notice that not all life events for John Jones are proven all at once. Each of these objectives will need to be addressed separately in their own proof. But depending on the evidence, some proofs may work well to be combined together, such as a birth proof and a parentage proof. This is for you, the researcher, to decide according to the evidence you're working with. I just want to make a few quick comments on accreditation here. Remember that for an ICAP Gen Level 1 project, the linkages between the generations are the most important. Sometimes the linkage proof is so complex that the applicant will take all the space available for a level one report just to prove those linkages. But oftentimes the generational linkage may be a little less complex so the applicant can choose to include other proofs to show off their research and their writing skills. Our objectives are to prove the birthplace and birth date of John Jones. And then the must have proof is the parentage of John Jones. And then we want to do a proof that covers the marriage place and date of John Jones and Mary Smith. And we also want to prove the death date and the death place of John Jones. So the next step is to make a list of the sources once you have the objectives all set. So you want to list these sources that you have for each proof that will actually prove the objective. You want to include the pertinent information found in each source. You want to eliminate irrelevant sources and information from your list. So for example, if you're using the marriage record listing the subject's age at the time of marriage to help prove that subject's birth year, it's not necessary to go into all the details covering the marriage information in detail, in this proof at least. Many beginning genealogical writers have a tendency to tackle a report by going through each source one by one and dissecting each and every piece of information found and covering every single clue from that source in detail in the report. This approach is what we do in the gathering and culling stage mentioned in, in the part one of this presentation. This overarching approach is not helpful at this stage. Now we're in the organizing stage and we only pull the information from each source that pertains to our current proof objective that we just established. If you can fully grasp this concept, your writing will fall into place. And we will cover this a little bit more in detail a little later on. So now we're back to our list. And the next point is to remember that one source may be used in multiple objectives because most sources used in a research report help prove more than one event or more than one fact or relationship. And so therefore they need to be covered each time they uh, bring about an important clue. So I hope this is very clear. This concept is a major stumbling block for many beginning writers of genealogical research reports. And our last bullet here 
is we want to organize all of our sources into an order of importance. You can do this by what is the most compelling source or by what is the flow of logic. So here's a list of sources for Susie Smithson's birth proof and another list for her parentage proof. You'll notice that two sources have been used twice in two different proofs. In the birth proof, the information from the 1850 census is used to give her birth year, which is 1835, uh, and she was born in Georgia. Whereas in the parentage proof, we're only really going to focus on the fact that she was in the household of Jim and Sally Smithson. Then for the marriage record, in the birth proof, it lists her age and that she was born about 1835. And it also states that she was married in Georgia. Whereas in the, parent the parentage proof, we are going to mostly focus on that it states her maiden name of Smithson, and it also states her married name of Snodgrass. Then we can go on and you can notice the other sources listed. The 1860 census, we have two different ones. In the birth proof, it's the one where Susie's with her husband. But when we get to the 1860 census for the parentage proof, we're actually moving on to prove that indirectly that Jim Smithson has his two sons living with him, Isaac and William. And we need to prove that they are Susie's brothers in order to prove that Jim and Sally are Susie's parents. Although the information discussed for each proof should be limited to the information pertaining to the proof objective, sometimes it is necessary to make a statement of identity confirmation. And that is a reasoning statement that indicates the records being discussed pertain to the correct individual. If it's very clear that this is the correct individual and um, you don't need to make a very defined statement. This example is in the syllabus. And so I'm not gonna read that in detail here. The next step is to evaluate. Once all the individual sources are outlined, it's time to fine tune that evaluation of the sources, information and the evidence. If you've made an evidence analysis chart as was mentioned in part one of this presentation, the evaluation will fall into place. It makes it really easy to transfer the information to your report. If you haven't taken the time to make an evidence analysis chart for this particular project, at least take the time to stop and think about the reliability of each source, the information and evidence, and make some notes in your research log. This will help you as you begin the writing process. This example and remaining examples can be found in the syllabus for further study. Here are a few of the questions that you need to ask yourself as you're evaluating the source's information and evidence. Which source is the most compelling and why? How reliable is each source? And be sure to discuss any issues of concern. Who was the informant and how reliable were they? One convincing evidence proves that these records pertain to the correct individual? Do the information and evidence correlate? Be sure to describe this in detail. Is the compiled and correlated evidence strong and compelling? And are there any conflicts that need to be resolved? Here's a list of the sources found that prove the parentage of Susie Smithson. Much of the evidence is indirect and needs to be explained thoroughly in the report. Notice that they're in a logical format to clearly lay out the proof for Susie's parentage. And keep in mind that I have simplified this proof for the purpose of presentation. On the right hand column, I have made some basic notes to help me get started with the writing process. So step four is to revisit your research and fill in the gaps. Once you start that organizing process, you may notice these gaps. And it's really important that you go back and redo some research if needed. Here's some questions you could ask yourself. Which evidence is weak and needs more proof? Are there holes in the logic? Is there sufficient correlation? 
What additional sources may add weight to the conclusion? What additional sources could give clues to resolve any conflicts that were found? Our last section is planning for writing. I'm going to cover some tools and techniques to give you ideas on how to plan for that writing phase. The techniques that we'll cover are building blocks, syllogisms, and multiple hypotheses. So let's start with building blocks. One approach is to start with the most compelling source and then add the next most compelling source and then add a source that adds some more weight and then a, another source that will add weight and so on. Be sure as you're stating the sources that you're also stating the information that was found in those sources. Another approach that works well and that I've used in the example here, it works well, especially with indirect evidence, is to place the sources in the most logical order to start getting that flow of logic going. So here we have source number one and source number two. Source number one is the US Census of Forsyth County, Georgia, where Susie's listed with Jim and Sally Smithson. It doesn't state that they're her parents. We, that's what we're trying to prove that they are. So that makes sense to start with that one. Then we move on to the 1859 marriage license of Susie to Hector Snodgrass. And this lists Susie's maiden name of Smithson. And one of the witnesses was her brother, William. And the 1869 marriage record for Isaac Smithson. And it this one states that Isaac was married at Hector and Susie Snodgrass's home. Now, the next one is the 1860 census also in Forsyth County, Georgia. This does not list Susie in this household with her parents, but it does list her brothers, Isaac and William with Jim and Susie Smithson. And as you notice, we had two sources that linked William and Isaac to the family. So the 1860 census helps solidify this. Notice that they're not in chronological order because that just didn't make the most sense to me. And the last source kind of starts to wrap it up at this point where Isaac and William are both living with Sally and, or Jim and Sally, and they are listed as sons. So here is a quick visual overview of building blocks. We're gonna order our sources. Then we're going to analyze each source one by one. So usually we start with source one, source two, and after we've analyzed them, we are going to make a statement of correlation. How does source one, how does source two support source one? Then we analyze source three and we add a statement of correlation. How, did, how does source three and source four correlate with the other sources and so on. The next technique is called a syllogism. And basically a syllogism is an if-then statement that shows the sequence of logic. And it helps the reader follow the logic better if you're using the terminology of if and then. So here's a visual of it. If point A is true, and if point B is true, then point C is true as well. So in the example, if Susie is the full sister of Isaac and William Smithson, and Isaac and William are the sons of Jim and Sally Smithson, then Susie is also the daughter of Jim and Sally Smithson. And the last technique we're going to cover is multiple hypotheses. And this works well when sorting out people of the same name and or when the conclusion is really not very clear yet. For example, I use this technique most often in research reports for clients when more research is still needed. This technique works well to help get things organized for the client so they can see what I've done. So basically with this technique, you're going to list hypothesis one and make all the points about that. Then you're gonna list hypothesis two and make the points you wanna make. And if possible, you're going to make a statement that either hypothesis one is correct or hypothesis two is correct because of such and such. So 
So there's also a few tools we have a little bit of time left to mention. Bullet lists is one of my most used tools. And I like the way it helps me keep things organized. We also are going to have time to mention timelines and charts. And then there's not time for it, but maps is another great thing to use. Also, don't forget to include transcriptions, extracts, and abstracts as needed. So for the birth and parents of John Jones, we have our we have an introduction here, and then we go through each point with some analysis. And you'll notice in the second bullet, which is a building, also a building block, we have some analysis and then we have some correlation. This example is in the syllabus, so you can read it there in full if you would like. Then our third building block is a bullet point where we have some more correlation. Building block number four also has correlation and some analysis. And building block five wraps it all up with correlation of the probate of the father. That helps prove that James Jones is the father of John Jones and that Sally Jones is also his mother. Here's an example of a timeline or a chart. This one is differentiating individuals with the same name. And as you can see, there are two William Jones, both born in 1835. Both were living in Lincoln County, Kentucky. But as you start moving over to this column over here, you start seeing some different parents. So now we got to figure out which one's which. We also see some different wives. And in the occupation column, we have different occupations. And we can start to sort them out. Here, that same chart is color-coded, so you can see the details sorted just a little bit more. Again, you can read this example in the syllabus, and this chart can be a tool that will help you get prepared for writing, but it could also be a chart that, if it was nice and concise, could also be included in the report itself. Thank you for watching part two of this presentation. Be sure to watch part one and three, and don't forget to download the syllabus. If you have questions, please feel free to contact me at my email address listed here. Thank you for joining me.